We are part of a continuum, a strong legacy that rolls out from the sacrifices, the blood, sweat, and tears of those who walk these same paths that we walk today with a steady beat and with weary feet. You may ask, what does this have to do with me, preacher? The Spirit is leading me to tell somebody today that our ancestors were the first to walk this earth. Someone needs to know that it was our ancestors, our African foreparents that brought civilization, religion, and science and the art. It is my hope that today's words can serve as a spiritual reboot, if you wanna say, a black consciousness upgrade. You see, both are necessary and essential because of all the negative viruses that are infecting and affecting us. You have to let go of what you can't keep in order to gain what you can't lose. This palm tree was trying to tell you, this young lady was trying to tell you that she as a palm tree has to let go of what she can't keep. She can't keep the concrete in order to gain what she can't lose, her peace, her sanity, her life. You have to let go of these, these shackles. You have to let go of this concrete around your feet, around your roots, around your brain. You have to let go of that slave mentality. We can liken that palm tree to many who were put on slave ships, who were shipped here, bound, the worst conditions ever. They were brought here in chains, stripped of everything. No family, no friends, no life. Brought here to create a society, a world that they knew nothing about. But there's a silent sin that, that no one tells you about when you join a church. Pastor didn't tell you in the invitational that sometimes it feels like walking with God is futile. He didn't tell you that sometimes being in the movement for the liberation of black people can feel thankless. Sometimes it feels lonely. He didn't tell you that sometimes it can be unforgiving. Why do I keep praying, yet there seems to be no answers? Why do I keep coming to church on Sunday, but nothing on Monday? Why do I keep fighting for the liberation of African people, yet we refuse to let go of the shackles of our mental slavery? We ask ourselves at times. As long as we show up and give the best that we can give, there is cosmic support to fill in the gaps. We pray, great ancestral spirit, always to remember the miracles of yesterday. And we pray for the willingness to be open to the miracles of tomorrow. O oh, divine host of hosts, we beseech your eternal love, hope, and compassion upon the lives and condition of your chosen us. people. Prepare our spirit, body, minds for the challenges and ordeals that may obstruct our path to your covenant promise. Remove all doubt and reservation that may hinder us from acting for you and the world. Embolden our walk that we may share the light of group salvation to seekers in search of a sign from you. O oh, cosmic goddess of creation, at a time such as this, be the light of hope and reconciliation that proves us worthy for building a kingdom with power here on earth. We send this collective petition to you, trusting that you have weighed our concerns among many. We trust your judgment will be swift one, and decisive. Our grand source way from maker, all let us continue flow. to strive for liberation, Lord of hosts, leaving godly matters to you. Insight, we ask this in all prayers in the name of our revolutionary example of great expectations. Jesus, the Lord, Black Messiah, our hearts, Ashe. our eyes, our Amen. minds, and our spirits are fully open to receive whatever your will and way determines is best for our collective well-being. Lord, keep us ever vigilant as we prepare, sacrifice, and work alongside our ancestral allies 
to build a better world for our people everywhere. Most High, during the season of Advent, grant us the spirit of compassion, the spirit of faith, the spirit of hope, and the spirit of love as we anticipate the incarnation of divine energy and power to be born anew within each of us. This prayer we pray in the name of our messianic agent and revolutionary example, Jesus of Nazareth. And we say Ashe and Amen. Today, black people are experiencing a rising level of consciousness that is raising our self-concept. Today, black women constitute the most educated segment of American society. Shrines of the Black Madonna, where we believe in you being your best self. We invite you to partake in our worship experience. Come with an open mind and an open heart. Sing, dance, and clap your hands. Follow us on all of our social media platforms. Giving is an opportunity for us to build community, ministry, health, and best self. Tap into your greatness that God has already placed inside of you and share it with the world. We would love to see you more often. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I believe that human society stands under the judgment of one God, revealed to all and known by many names. His creative power is visible in the mysteries of the universe. In the revolutionary Holy Spirit, which will not long permit men and women to endure injustice, nor to wear the shackles of bondage and the rage of the powers when they struggle to be free. And in the violence and conflict, which even now threaten to level the hills and the mountains. I believe that Jesus, the Black Messiah, was a revolutionary leader sent by God to rebuild the Black nation Israel and to liberate African people from powerlessness, from the oppression, brutality, and exploitation of the white Gentile world. I believe, I believe, I believe that the revolutionary spirit of God embodied in the black Messiah is born anew in each generation. And that black Christian nationalists constitute the living remnants of God's chosen people in this day and are charged by God with responsibility for the liberation of African people. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. I believe. That both my survival and my salvation depend upon my willingness to reject individualism. And so I commit my life to the liberation struggle of African people and accept the values, ethics, morals, and programs of the black nation defined by that struggle and taught by the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church. We voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the
Stony the road we tried, bitter the chastening ride, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, felt with a steady To the place for which our father sighed. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory. Ramza Moja. The African tradition of Ramza Moja is a celebration of first fruits. Ramza is a key Swahili expression that means festival, and Moja means first. During the Festival of Lights, we honor the harvest of our collective work to nation building as we gather in sacred fellowship. Unlike traditional American celebration, Thanksgiving in the black community post the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 began as a church-based celebration. Black pastors often gave sermons about our people's struggles, hopes, fears, and triumphs. The sermons usually grieved the institution of slavery, the suffering of black people, and often pleaded for an awakening of a slave-free America. Moreover, it was a time when the enslaved often attempted to escape due to the ending of crop season. The Gospel of Luke chapter 10 teaches that after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church, we interpret this passage from an African mindset that compels us to do what Jesus, our black Messiah, did throughout his earthly revolutionary ministry. As missionaries co-creating with God, we first must reflect an attitude of peace. Second, we must be committed to individual and collective healing, both physically and spiritually, as did Jesus, so that we represent wholeness. Lastly, we must go as we are divinely sent out as laborers seeking the work of God. This, brothers and sisters, is the power of mutual transformation. Happy Ramzamoja. <laughs>
So get connected and stay connected with us online at the Shrine of the Black Madonna Virtual Village. Travel. Ain't only preachers got a little trick they do. Is, when you travel, you take what's called your stick sermons, your or horse sermons. These are sermons that you've used before in some form or fashion, and you know they're strong messages. And so these are the messages you travel with. They're more evangelistic, more positive, more upbeat. But I got to sign the sermon topic this time. Yeah. <laughs> I told Candia he assigned me, and he said, no, let Elijah assigned it. Well. <laughs> but in a rare moment of reflection, I actually accepted the assignment. And I thought about what it was that they wanted the subject to be. And it led me to a place other than what I would have been delivering a message on this morning. It led me to a darker place. It led me to a more grotesque place than I would normally be at when I'm traveling. They had a topic, our legacy and future, where do we go from here? And it is not an evangelistic message. It's not a happy message. If I had to categorize it, I would say, it's a warning. It's a warning. In the Bible, the task of warning was the task of the prophets. You know, prophets normally didn't have good news. They were trying to make you aware of something. They were not happy and encouraging most times. They were issuing warnings and telling people that the consequences they were facing were really beyond anything that they could imagine. Consequently, prophets weren't the most, po uh, weren't the most popular people in town. People see the prophet coming and a lot of times would go the other way. The prophet was not popular, but it was respected. And Shrine has always been a prophetic church. We'd always been trying to make black people aware of the realities of the world we live in. So that we could engage in some intelligent and appropriate action. And just like the prophets, that has not made us the most popular church in town in any time that we're in. We're not the most popular, but we've always told black people the truth, and so there is none more respected. As this Jesse Jackson said, the shrine is not a big church, but it has a big message, and that makes it a powerful church. Give me a powerful church over a big church any day. We believe that running a church and running for office is not a popularity contest. It's serving God by serving the people that sent you there. So I want to talk about this assigned subject, our legacy and future. Where do we go from here? Our scripture is from the book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 41 through 44, and reads as follows. If you, even you, had recognized in this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you 
and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you and the children within your walls to the ground. And they will not leave one stone standing upon another within you. All because you did not recognize your opportunity when God offered it. Yeah. On a bright summer day in 1973, I was on duty as a security officer at the BCN National Training Center when I received a call from the seventh floor. It was our beloved founder, Jeremoji Abebe Ajman, also known as Reverend Albert B. Clegg, Jr. He told me that he had a guest coming that afternoon and instructed me to escort him directly up to his apartment when he arrived. About a half hour later, a distinguished looking gentleman walked into the lobby of the building and announced that he was here to see Reverend Clay. I recognized him immediately as Coleman Young. I had read the newspaper just that day about how after 30 years of loyal service, United Auto Workers and the Democratic Party had decided not to endorse the state senator for mayor of Detroit. They said, it was not the right time for a black male. Instead, they gave the endorsement to a young liberal white professor from Wayne State. Black people didn't appreciate it. I neither. We were all salty. Throughout the black community, there was a sense of insult and betrayal. We were in a time of black revolution. We didn't take this stuff no more. We had a different mentality. This wasn't back on the plantation where the white man got to pick our leadership. We had passed that point. We were in a time of black revolution. So we didn't like it. We were salty. I promptly signed Coleman Young in and escorted him up to Jeremiah's department. He opened the door, they shook hands, Chairmoji told me, thank you, the door closed. I went back downstairs. About three hours later, both men came back downstairs, stepping off the elevator in a jovial and jocular mood. They acted like schoolmate buddies who were getting ready to play a prank on somebody. <laughs> they stopped at the front door, exchanged pleasant trees, shook hands, and said goodbye. And on his way back to the apartment, Jeremoji passed by me and said, with a smile on his face, we're going into politics. And the next day, the black slate was born. <laughs> After that, every day, hundreds of black slate volunteers canvassed the streets of Detroit. And a conscious black community responded in unity and common purpose reflecting that it was a new day in Detroit. Black people were determined to control our own destiny and demonstrated their attitude of political self-determination by electing Coleman Young mayor against the wishes of the white power structure that had controlled the city for years. The black slate was founded during a time of the black revolution. A time when black people were suddenly clear that we were in a struggle for power to control our own destiny. We were clear about our intention to define ourselves, to defend ourselves, to educate ourselves, to provide for ourselves, and to choose our own leaders. It was a time of group struggle for group benefits. It was a time of black revolution. Black people's involvement in politics during this time grew out of black people's broader struggle for freedom, justice, and power. The people seeking office had primarily come out of a tradition of struggle. They had roots 
in organizations that have been involved in the struggle for years. The Voting Rights Act had suddenly opened up new possibilities for black people that weren't there in years past. So politics was considered by revolutionaries as a new front in the liberation struggle. Black elected officials entered office with a sense of mission, understanding that they represented more than themselves. They represented the hopes and dreams of a long ignored, long oppressed people. And their election was an opportunity, no, a duty, to do something that would improve conditions for the people that sent them there. Elected officials of that era had a resume of service. They didn't just show up. They had a track record. They paid some dues. They had some receipts. They considered themselves public servants rather than Negro royalty. They had an attitude of servant leadership. They knew that their occupation of a political office was more about us than it was about them. We had common agendas and shared strategies. We had cooperation around our collective interests. It was a time of black revolution. And this was the politics of self-determination. Here we are 50 years later, and we're in a very different time. We're no longer in a time of black revolution. We no longer have a politics of group self-determination. It's more a politics of personal celebrity, a politics of individual opportunity. Political office is no longer a tool to fight oppression. It's a jobs program. It's, about, it's not about public service, but about seeking fame or serving corporate masters. Not a struggle for liberation, but a competition for the limelight or a pathway to personal wealth. The organizations that served as springboards of support and mechanisms of accountability are long gone. The sense of urgency that led to enthusiastic community involvement is non-existent. This is not a time of black revolution. So when we ask the question, where do we go from here? We have to start by understanding the kind of times we are in. We're not in a time of black revolution. We are not. Black people are not fired up seeking imminent change, imminent change, expecting things to change suddenly overnight. We are not fired up to be aggressively involved in the, in the areas of life that affect our children and children's children. We are not in a time of black revolution. Oddly enough, we're in a time of a white revolution. A white nationalist revolution, to be exact. And it's been developing for years while we were not paying attention. It started as people became aware of the growing demographic shift that was gradually but inevitably making the country darker, younger, more tolerant, and more progressive. In 2006, Bill Clinton got up at a national leadership summit among the elites of the country and told that audience, we are entering a time of power sharing. We have to determine what will be the terms of that sharing. We can't have the whole table anymore. We have to settle for a seat at the table. 
Well, you know that didn't go over too well. They didn't like that at all. For many white Americans, the unthinkable was upon them. The dubious distinction of becoming the first country in history where the white majority became a minority sent shock waves through America's leadership. Then just as they were beginning to wrap their minds around what was happening, Barack Obama was elected president of the United States. <laughs> now the demographic shift was no demographic shift was no longer just the concern of elites, scientists, experts, and politicians. Now the average white person became aware of the browning of America. And for people whose self-image and sense of superiority was tied to white dominance. This was an existential crisis. A fear and foreboding began to spread across the country. It was discussed in places far away from where we could hear. On AM talk radio, in civic club meetings, in conservative think tanks and research institutions, but mostly in churches in churches. Suddenly it seemed like the white world was coming apart. We didn't have any idea what was going on. We were so caught up with a black man getting off of Air Force One with his pretty little family doing everything right. Representing us in the best possible way. Letting us come to the White House to take pictures we were so caught up in that that we didn't understand what was going on behind that. A black president in the United States in their faces for eight years had an effect on white people. Warnings of an inevitable demographic tsunami turning the country darker and younger had an effect on white people. A migrant invasion of people spilling across the southern border every day had an effect on white people. An opioid epidemic that became the number one cause of death for young white men had an effect on white people. Mysterious deaths of despair, where white people were suddenly dying from curable diseases because their hearts were broken over the perceived decline in the value of whiteness had an effect on white people. An unexplained fertility crisis where white men's sperm all of a sudden forgot how to swim, causing a drop in fertility rates, had an effect on white people. All of a sudden, all of this was enough to make some scream, white genocide! But nobody was killing them. Circumstances was killing them. Many white evangelical churches began preaching that white Christians were the most oppressed and discriminated against segment of the American population. And young white men believed it proved positive of their victimization that they couldn't earn enough to support a family with only a high school diploma. A white revolution was gaining momentum. A white revolution driven by white grievance. They were mad at their circumstance that was changing overnight. It was gaining momentum and black people were sleeping through the whole thing. You know, white grievance is a strange word. I don't know what white people got to be aggrieved about. They stole the land and they got free labor for hundreds of years. I don't understand what they got to be aggrieved about. They came from nothing and got over here and became landowners and business owners and professionals. I don't understand what they got to be aggrieved about, but that, that's, I, no, that's me. I just get caught up on words, white grievance. 
with white grievance growing like wildfire. The Tea Party began electing crazy people to office. <laughs> with no qualifications whatsoever, other than they were mad about the direction of the country. And white nationalist propagandists stoked grievance into fear. Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, Bill O'Reilly, Tucker Carlson, Steve Bannon, and the whole cast of characters over at Fox News and many others contributed to convincing white people that they were under siege. Somebody was coming for them and coming for their stuff. They were in a panic and we had no idea. Donald Trump said he was sitting in a McDonald's one day, eating a Big Mac, when he suddenly realized that the waves of white grievance were powerful enough to make him president. And that's when he decided to run. The most effective of these white nationalist propagandists, Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon was a military intelligence officer who studied the strategies of a Russian military intelligence officer by the name of Alexander Dugin. Dugin was one of those people in Russia that didn't like the breakup of the Soviet Union and he feared that Russia would become just like America and become a democratic multicultural country. Well, he couldn't have that. So he devised a fascist plan to prevent Russia from becoming a democratic, multicultural country. He advocated dividing Russia among a small inner circle of oligarchs loyal to Putin. Break up the minds, break up the communication system, break up all the aspects of government, and give them to people who are loyal to you. They will be billionaires, but they will be loyal to you. And you will have created a cartel that gives us minority control of the country. Putin listened, and it worked. Realizing that white people would soon become a minority in America, the racist neo-confederate white nationalist Steve Bannon saw the handwriting on the wall. And he adopted Dugin's strategy of minority rule. He advocated these ideas in his newspaper, Breitbart News. This information caught on with the wealthy and white nationalist politicians and alt-right activists. And he created an admiration society for Russia. The rich and white wing advocates were suddenly visiting Russia and praising their former enemy like it was a long lost relative. Putin became a celebrity, a leader to be admired. In 2007, the, the uh, American Times Magazine Man of the Year was Vladimir Putin. American white nationalists promoted Russia as the ideal society. White, Christian, heterosexual, and patriarchal. That is everything they wanted America to be. White, Christian, heterosexual, and patriarchal. A return to the time when the world was firmly controlled by straight, white, Christian men. So Steve Bannon became the architect of Donald Trump's campaign. And this is why almost everybody in the Trump camp had Russian ties. They loved him some Russia. Russia was the model of what they wanted to create. They wanted ties with Russia. They wanted information from Russia on how you did it. And this is why Donald Trump has such a bromance with Vladimir Putin. Amen. They put their plan to get minority control of the country into motion. I'm still talking about the white revolution. With the backing of billionaires, 
They bought the Congress yep. and the Supreme Court. Yep. But they couldn't buy the public. So they had to persuade them. And this wasn't hard. Because for the millions of white people displaced by deindustrialization, that shipped their good paying jobs overseas, the successful black person with a good job, a professional degree, a new car, and kids in private school was the embodiment of everything that was wrong with America. Many white people felt angry and betrayed by their leaders. Their white, white nationalists began a coordinated campaign to magnify this anger. Their goal was to destroy the public trust of all the foundational institutions that allow America to function as a civil society. They declared them all, all the institutions, to be corrupt, oppressive, ineffective, and obsolete. Whatever inconvenient truths that contradicted their beliefs, when somebody brought some new information they didn't like, they said, fake news, fake news. But what about this, fake news. They could deny anything on the basis of, you can't trust none of these suckers. They done sold you out. The elections are crooked. You can't trust the authorities, the experts, the cable TV news, they're all in it together. And when Steve Bannon stood before microphones and said his goal was to destroy the administrative state, he's talking about destroying public confidence in all institutions that hold society together. And then blaming whatever is wrong or lacking in your life due to their failure. That is why Donald Trump said you can't trust the FBI, the Justice Department, the State Department, the news media, the experts, the professionals, the judges, the churches, the colleges, the universities, the CDC, the elections, the polls, the Democrats, the Republicans, your doctor, your pastor, your parents, your friends. You can only trust me. Only I can make it right. Only I can stop it. Only I can restore order. Only I can make America great again. And he became the Peckerwood Messiah <laughs> with a cult like following. A cult like following. He can do anything. Now you could ask, how could a significant portion of the country fall for this? Well, it's called metapolitics. It, uh, it, was, it was developed by some really sneaky people doing some really sneaky stuff. But it's a technique of mass manipulation where you infiltrate the entire culture with your ideas. The idea in this case was the system is rigged against you and you can't trust anybody. They infiltrated Facebook and Twitter and talk radio with suspicious paranoia. They paid an army of out of work white people to become trolls. People on their computers at home, in their underwear, in their basement, or in their garage who sent out hundreds of millions of false stories, misinformation, and manipulative ideas to influence the whole culture. Steve Bannon was clear about, he said, we're in a war. And at this point, it ain't a shooting war. It's a culture war. We got to change the culture. We got to introduce ideas that are contradictory to what people believe, but they got to be overwhelmed with these ideas to the point that it begins to seep in and they question the things that they've been indoctrinated with. This strategy was designed to create chaos and fear and uncertainty and insecurity. And white people don't do fear, uncertainty, and insecurity very well. They are used to control and confidence and certainty and security, so they're particularly uncomfortable and vulnerable when they feel threatened. All 
alt-right alt -right strategists understood that people existing in a state of fear, yes. in a state of danger, in a state of insecurity, affects the amygdala or the brain stem, that portion of the brain known as the animal brain or the reptile brain. Yes. This part of the brain is non-rational and is non-thinking. It simply responds to perceived danger with a fight or flight reflex until the danger is gone. Yes, yes. It has no other function. It doesn't feel. It has no beliefs or morals. It overrides the higher rational portion of the brain. The amygdala is older and way more powerful than the higher thinking brain, the neocortex. It's so much more powerful that the higher brain is described as a child riding an elephant. You sitting there trying to reason with somebody when they're engaged with the reptile brain and you're wasting your time. You know that if you ever got an argument with somebody where they were really angry, it didn't make a difference what you said. I had that experience with my wife one day. She was so mad, it didn't make a difference what I said. I could argue the point so I could say, I'm sorry, baby. None of it made any difference. When the reptile brain is engaged, it shuts off all that higher thinking, reasoning, religion, morality. It shuts all that off. So if you can get people to be angry enough, they will do some terrible, absolutely diabolical things. This little excursion in the neuroscience helps us to understand why people are going so crazy. Yeah. Fox News is not a news organization. Yeah. It's a mass manipulation tool. Yeah. Yeah. They're showing people the same stuff over and over and over. Yeah. To make them more and more and more angry. Showing people, these, a lot of people watching Fox News ain't never seen a black person. Except on TV. They're not around black people. They don't know anything about how we are. But they're fed with how we are with these clips over and over and over. Behind the talking head are these pictures of black people stealing, robbing, cutting, killing, looting. They know exactly what they're doing. They are deliberately destroying the credibility of the institutions that hold society together to make people live in fear and willing to turn to anything to make it stop. Stoking the fires of white grievances to form this manipulation has taken on today. And while black people are going on with life as usual, right, white people are running with scissors with their hair on fire in fear of the day when black people will have the upper hand and we will treat them the same way they have treated us. So, so for a significant population, significant portion of the white population, this has become an all or nothing existential crisis, a struggle for raw survival, and they're willing to do anything to make it stop. When you see these young white male mass shooters, they all say the same thing. I had to do it. I had to do it. I had to stop them. These young white male mass shooters are the Frankenstein monsters of white nationalism. They, they believed the stuff that they were hearing and believed the stuff they were reading on the internet. All those insurrectionists now standing in front of the judge are saying, but I thought we were, I thought we all were gonna, I thought uh, the president called me. I believe we needed to come. I, 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 I. And, and the judge sent them to jail, and they can't believe it because they bought the hype. They believe what they were being told. MAGA Republicans in Congress are not there to govern. They want to blow up the whole thing. They want to stop anything from being done. That's why you got this old drunk they trying to make speak of the house. Jim Jordan, Jim Jordan, Jim Jordan is a joke. They cleaned him up, gave him a shave, and the shave keep coming back. 
<laughs> He's an old drunk tea party guy that was, he was just mad. They dressed him up and ran him from office. They tried to make him. They tried to make this insurrection as a speaker of the house. They're not there to govern. They want to blow up everything. They don't want anything to be worked out. They want stalemate. They want gridlock. They want to shut the government down. They want no compromise. All to discredit democracy. To discredit the present administration and to discredit democracy. And you look at the TV, they may seem like they're crazy, but they're not. They know exactly what they're doing. They want people to be sick and tired of politics. They want to pay, make people so disgusted with politics that they might be willing to try something else. They don't want democracy. They want a strong man, a dictator, to champion their cause and their values. And if they ever get control of the government again, that is exactly what they're going to do. Donald Trump has already stated what he's going to do. He said out of his own mouth, every department of government is going to operate through me. He plans to weaken or abolish the FBI, the State Department, the Department of Education, the IRS. And he's going to fire the people he considers the deep state. That's any, anybody that interferes with what he wants to do. He's going to appoint his own people and they're going to take a loyalty oath to him personally, like a mafia godfather. You know, democracy has always been professed to be the highest value in American life. Every war fought by this country has been about saving or spreading democracy. Any claim America's ever had to world leadership has been built on spreading democracy. The U.S. foreign policy has always been about the sanctity of democracy. The CIA has undermined, overthrown, and assassinated people all over the world to defend democracy. But now that white people face a future where they're no longer a numerical majority, they don't want democracy anymore. 75% of Republicans have rejected democracy. 90% of Republicans oppose making it easier to vote. They say if we let everybody vote, we'll lose control. Yeah, that's democracy. 83% believe that violence is justified to maintain control. And these people are especially threatened by black advancement. And they're determined to cut it out of every area of life. You know, billionaires sit up there with nothing else to do, look out and see Negroes doing a little better, and decide he's going to fund something to make it stop. And funded by na white nationalist billionaires, they've carried out a systematic effort to roll back the rights and opportunities of black people. They've already undermined our voting rights, eliminated affirmative action, stopped police reform, eviscerated reproductive rights, outlawed the truthful teaching of history, gutted public education, and prevented student debt forgiveness. Now they're seeking to make it illegal to give black people, a black person or any black organization money on the basis that supporting anything specifically for black people is a form of racial discrimination. And if that gets before the Supreme Court, you know what's going to happen. One of the most disturbing possibilities of the whole white nationalist revolution is the American Legislative Exchange Council's plan to call for a constitutional convention. Yes, yes. A constitutional convention is if two-thirds of the state legislatures agree, they can call a constitutional convention to change the Constitution. The Republicans already control 22 states. And if they get control of 33, they can write a new constitution and redefine the country. You know any constitution they come up with is going to reflect their anti-democratic views. 
on issues like who is a citizen? Yes. Who has rights? If you have rights, what rights do you have? Who gets to vote? What do you get to vote for? What's legal? What's illegal? You know, slavery was legal. Jim Crow was legal. What if you have a constitution where it's legal again? You can rest assured these questions are not going to be answered in a way that serves our interests. If democracy fails, black people will be set back a hundred years. It will be Jim Crow 2.0, a new American apartheid. And we'll be just like the Palestinians in Gaza, resident aliens who live under the rule of a government that we cannot meaningfully participate in. We must be concerned with what happens to black people in this kind of America. This is not a joke. I'm not telling you this to make you happy. I'm telling you that we got a problem that we have to solve and we have to be aware of the grave nature of the future we face because we actually do have the power to stop it. There's a white nationalist revolution in America and the people who have created it are not going to stop. They fear their time may be up. They are determined to make the future look like the past. They believe that this is a country built by white people, for white people, through white sacrifice, and white courage, and white ingenuity, and white suffering, and white heroism, and white labor. And they believe it is their God-given duty to preserve white supremacy no matter what the cost. They are willing to topple the foundations of civilization to preserve the status quo. One author calls this attitude white manism. White manism, a permanent insurrectionist mindset based on the belief that there is no law when it comes to defending white supremacy. Andre, Andre E. Key warns in Guns, God, and Government, whatever we do to preserve democracy and the rule of law at this moment will determine what kind of nation we will live in for the foreseeable future. There is no easy solution but doing nothing is not an option. Either take a stand or prepare for white minority rule. For most of us, it will not be pretty. Our scripture is a warning. It's a warning to people who are not aware that they're in imminent danger. Jesus comes to a high place overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and he sees people who have no idea of what's coming. They're going on with life as usual, focused on the small, immediate issues of their small, immediate lives. And they're making the usual choices and the usual plans, vacation, weddings, graduation. They have no sense of urgency. They are not paying any attention to the signs of the time. So the Bible says Jesus weeps and says, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in. On every side, they will dash you and your children within your walls to the ground, and they will not leave one stone standing upon another within you, all because you did not recognize your opportunity when God offered it. Yeah. They couldn't see it, but Jesus could see it. Yeah. Today, I don't know about you, but I can see it. Yeah. I can see where we're heading. Yeah. And I'm not the only one. Yeah. There are many people across the country who are trying to sound the alarm and warning that we are all dancing on top of a volcano. Mm -hmm. 
And the only way to stop it is to prevent these fools from getting control of the government. That means getting seriously involved in the politics of black self-determination. Just think, if we can just get most black people to vote, we can prevent the white nationalist revolution from gaining control of the government. See, they got to gain control of the government. That's what the insurrection was about, to gain control of the government. Once you gain control of the government, you tell people anything you want to. It's all about gaining control of the government. You know, Hitler was elected. He gained control of the government through an election. But once he got his hand on the government, he did what he wanted to do. We got to prevent them from getting their hands on the control of the government before it's too late. But our beloved founder used to say you can't organize a sleeping people. You got to wake them up first. Well, we need to dedicate ourselves to being black people's alarm clock. We need to be a wake up call. We need to sound the alarm. Somebody need to call 9 11. It don't take a whole lot of sense to holler. We need to holler. We need to draw some attention. So, why are they acting a the fool on the bus? If enough people act the fool, Pretty soon they'll put it together. They trying to let us know something. They trying to sound the alarm. We have a role to play. We can't sit back and watch TV like this is a spectator sport. We have a role to play. Our beloved founder taught that politics is sacred because it's a programmatic tool to fight against oppression. To fight against oppression. Damn right. Politics is a tool. And we should have enough sense to use it to serve our interests. Not as a vehicle for personal ambition or any other petty agenda. If politics is sacred, then it's God's work. And we all have something to do. We all have a role to play. If politics is sacred, then it has to be a central part of our religious obligation. Right. If politics is sacred, there is no contradiction between it and our church program. If politics is sacred, then we have to be more intentional about our participation. We still have a lot of people who think voting doesn't matter. And in a little while, you might be right. So you better vote while you can. But voting is not enough. We have to commit ourselves to the politics of black self-determination that's dedicated to building the power to control our own destiny. If politics is sacred, we have to be more than an election day operation. We have to be a 365 day machine institution with power to reward our friends and punish our enemies. If politics is sacred, we need our own political action committees media platforms, systems of accountability, educational programs, think tanks, research institutions. If politics is sacred, we must build meaningful coalitions with any organizations and institutions that can help us accomplish our goals. If politics is sacred, we have to be seriously involved in the effort to save democracy because a democratic America is the only kind of America where we have any opportunity to participate in politics at all. If a democratic America goes, we are absolutely powerless. We back on the plantation. We back in the cotton field. We back up under Jim Crow. We back at the back of the bus. We back in the caboose of the train. And there ain't nothing we can do about it. The Black Slate is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church is celebrating its 70th anniversary. I know we, we've been on the battlefield fighting for our people for a long time now. But we got to keep on fighting. And some of us are getting old now. But we got to keep on fighting. Some of us may be getting tired now. But we got to keep on fighting. A lot of our brothers and sisters, comrades and allies have transitioned to the ancestral realm 
but we got to keep on fighting. Sometimes it may seem like our labor might be in vain, but we got to keep on fighting. Sometimes we might feel like we're out there by ourselves, but we got to keep on fighting. And especially in the midst of a white nationalist revolution, we have to keep on fighting because the Lord, the Lord has called us to this work. And we still believe that nothing, 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 nothing is more sacred than the liberation of black people. Amen. And I say.